and from Mark 11. Now, when they drew near to Jerusalem, to Bethphage and Bethany in the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples and said to them, go into the village in front of you, and immediately as you enter it, you will find a colt tied on which no one has ever sat. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, why are you doing this? Say, the Lord has need of it, and we'll send it back here immediately. And when they went away and found a colt, they went away and found a colt at a door outside in the street, and they untied it. And some of those standing there said to them, what are you doing untying the colt? And they told them that what Jesus had said, and they let them go. And they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it, and he sat on it. And many spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches that they cut from the fields. And those who went before and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Uh, Happy Palm Sunday. Uh, More importantly, happy Master's Sunday for those of you guys out there. Come on, anybody? Okay, we'll work on you. Uh, It is an honor to be with you guys here today. Uh, It is an honor to bring God's word to you here. My name is Matt Van Zandt. I am one of the elders here at Sojourn. This is my first time to ever preach to my own church family, which comes with great excitement and also great nerves. Uh, But my hope this morning is simply this. My hope is to be helpful. My hope is to be clear. And my hope is to leave you with something that I believe that God has for us here this morning from this specific text. And so with that said, I want to pray one more time very briefly before we dive into the word. Jesus, thank you for your word. I pray that you would prepare our hearts to hear what it is you have for us this morning. May it nourish the souls of those in here today. Lord, help me. I'm nervous, but I'm confident that you want us to hear this today. Speak clearly through me this morning. We pray this all in your name. Amen. So as a church, we've been journeying through the book of Mark. Uh, the Mark is one of four accounts of Jesus' life found in the Bible. We have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They, we often refer to these as gospels. But in Mark's uh, book, he opens up in Mark 1.1, and he opens us up with the answer to the test. He goes ahead and tells us what he is going to be emphasizing throughout this whole book. And he makes this statement. Simply, Jesus is the Son of God. You see, the son of, term Son of God has historically been used for many rulers in many kingdoms throughout, the, throughout ages past of people who have tried to, de- to claim divine authority. Most relevantly, the emperor of Rome at this time was a guy named Caesar Augustus. He was the nephew made adoptive son of a guy that we've all heard of named Julius Caesar, right? Thank you. Two years before his death, Julius Caesar was deified. He was made a god in Roman culture, thus bringing about a very appropriate, a very relevant term for Caesar Augustus, and that is this, son of God. Now, Caesar Augustus, he was not shy about this. He put it on coins. There were statues that represented this all throughout society. He was not trying to hide the fact that he had this title. In fact, it was the exact opposite. But this is the backdrop that Mark makes his opening statement to a people who live under the reign and rule of Caesar Augustus. It's as if, no, it's not as if, Mark is saying this. Jesus is the true king, not Caesar Augustus. And then throughout his gospel, Mark goes on to outline Jesus' ministry through Galilee, where Jesus is displaying this authority through Acts, and then spends time with his followers and teaches teaches them what it means to live under the reign and rule of this true king, King Jesus. And in Mark 8, he starts to say that Jesus is heading towards Jerusalem. And then we pick it up here in Mark 11, where Jesus is making his entry, shall we call it his triumphal entry, into Jerusalem. 
But there is one plot twist that we need to get into. Jesus is going to enter the city right now to the praise of crowds here. But just a week later, he will be taken outside the city, not to the praises of crowds, but to the shouts of crowds and be crucified. Why? Well, let's get into it. Go ahead and open up your Bibles to Mark chapter 11. That's where we will be this morning. Um, as we read through this passage, if you're a note taker like myself, as we read through this passage, I want you to have two things in mind as we walk through the scriptures, okay? One is Jesus is making a claim here to be God's promised Savior King. Some would call it the Messiah. Secondly, Jesus is not the kind of king that the people expected. So Jesus is making a claim here to be God's promised Savior King, and Jesus is not the kind of king that the people expected. So let's get into it. Verses 1 and 2. Now when they drew near to Jerusalem, to Bethphage and to Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples and said to them, go into the village in front of you, and immediately as you enter it, you will find a colt tied on which no one has ever sat. Untie it and bring it. So Jesus is coming from Bethany, where in John chapter 11, we see that Jesus has just raised Lazarus from the dead, And rightfully so, let's just say it got people's attention. People were sleeping on Jesus, and they're like, okay, all right, all right, now I'm gonna gonna check out this Jesus guy. He's heading into Jerusalem, very significant, the very center of Israel's religious life. It was the place of messianic expectations where God had told his people to look for a coming savior king that was going to defeat his enemies, their enemies, establish a reign, and the people of God would dwell underneath the reign and rule of this king forever. In Matthew's account, he gives a little more specificity. He gives us uh, Zechariah 9.9, and he is showing us that Jesus is directly fulfilling this prophecy that we see in Zechariah 9.9. I'm going to read it. I think it should be behind me. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion, Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. Righteous and having salvation is he. Humble and mounted on a donkey. On a colt, the foal of a donkey. You see, for millennia, the people of God have been waiting for this king. Jesus is up on the Mount of Olives, which is an elevated place, probably doesn't need to be said, don't know too many mountains that aren't elevated, Uh, looking down through the Kidron Valley into the city, and he instructs two of his disciples to go into that city and get a colt and bring it back to him. Let's keep going. And if anyone says to you, why are you doing this? Say, the Lord has need of it, and we'll send it back here immediately. And they went away and found a colt tied at a door outside in the street, and they untied it. And some of those standing there said to them, what are you doing untying the colt? And they told them what Jesus had said, and they let them go. Now, okay, I admittedly, I had to laugh at this section, okay? I was trying to actually think about what would be a modern-day equivalent of this. You know, I head over to 19th Street. I'm trying to find some sort of modest car, Right? I, I mean, I know you guys think I'm a high roller because I drive a Hyundai Sonata, but I think it's a pretty uh, modest car. So I find a Hyundai Sonata. I'm peeking in the windows. I'm grabbing a few of the door handles. And the owner walks out. And he goes, what are you doing? And I go, Dodds Pinger needs this car. Right? But don't worry, sir. When we are done, we will get it back to you swiftly. Right? And he is a trustworthy fellow. Right? Oh, go ahead. Take it. Right? So just a hilarious thing. Nobody stops them. No, I mean, either that or Mark didn't feel the need to write this in, but I just had so many questions going through this part. So I digress in that, but let's see. So Jesus tells them to go get this colt, and they simply do that. And guess what? The colt is there. Not a surprise, right? It's probably, it's probably to be said that if Jesus says something is going to happen, it's probably going to happen. So they go and get it, and they bring it back to him. Now let's keep going. This is where it gets good. And they brought the colt to Jesus, and they threw their cloaks on it, and he sat on it. And many spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches that they had cut from the fields. 
Okay, so what's interesting about this is that up until this point, all we see is that these people are doing what they have been told. Hey, go get a cold, and they're like, hey, great, I'll go get a cold. I can do what I'm told, right? But now what is starting to enter is people are initiating their own acts. Nobody tells them to take off their cloaks. Nobody tells them to cut branches, right? And we see in here, and why I think this is significant, is that at this point, we see that the people that are involved in this story are starting to draw some conclusions, and with those conclusions come expectations as to how, what is about to play out. So it mentions that they took off their outer garments. You know, was somebody there wearing a Louis Vuitton, you know, leather jacket and thinking, man, Jesus deserves the best leather. I'm going to put it on the donkey. He's going to get up on that good leather. No, that's not what's happening. In 2 Kings 9, which we read earlier, Elijah is commanded by God to anoint Jehu as king over Israel. And every man took off his outer garment, they put it under Jehu as he walked, and they blew a trumpet, and they proclaimed, Jehu is king. You can see the similarities here. It's because outer garments were a symbol of authority. By placing them underneath Jesus, by putting them on top of the donkey, and Jesus sitting there, not making contact with the donkey, but having to make contact with their garments before it hits the donkey, and then putting it on the ground that the donkey would not make contact with the ground, but would actually make contact with their garments. There was this symbol. They were taking off their own authority, and they were placing it under the authority of this soon-to-be king. It is as if they were saying, Jesus is king, and I will trust him. We will gladly sit under his authority. Remember my first point. Jesus is making a claim here. This is all intentional. This is all playing out just like he thought it would. But not only outer garments. We see they were cutting palm branches, kind of a weird thing. Why palm branches? They were laying them on the ground, and they were likely waving them, although none of the Gospels, I didn't realize that until this, none of the Gospels actually say they're waving them, but it's the tradition, and there's a lot of other parts of texts in the Bible and history that probably proves that they were probably waving them. Why palm branches? You see, to Israel, palm branches were a symbol of nationalism and of victory. In 164 BC, Syria controlled Israel, and they were ruthless towards the Jewish people. They did horrific things to them. If you're into Googling horrific things that people do to one another, Google Syria to Jerusalem in this time. It's terrible. They were mocking the God of Israel. They were setting up pagan gods, statues in the temple of the God of Israel. They were mocking him. They were trying to forcefully paganize the city. But there was a courageous family, the Maccabeans. Some of you guys have heard of this. It's called the Maccabean Revolt. They rallied a bunch of people. They led a revolt into the city. And while they were going into the city, they were waving palm branches. Now, this was a successful revolt. They pushed back the Syrians. They reclaimed the city. They cleansed the temple. And they established hopes for a royal dynasty forever. Now, you can imagine if you're a people and you worship a God who has a home and it's called the temple and God has told you that one day a forever reigning king is going to come back and dwell in this temple. You're going to live under the reign and rule forever. And yet you are looking at that temple and it's occupied by an enemy nation. They're making a mockery of it. You can imagine then that hopes could be dwindling. They could be hurting. They could be doubting. Where is God? Where is he? But because of this courageous family, we see that it restored the hopes. God is faithful. He is going to do this. So Israel adopted palm branches as a symbol of victory in the expectation of a king who was going to come in and reign forever. Now let's think back to our text. In our text, these branches... They showed that the expectation of Jesus is that he was going to go into the city with military force. He was going to take back this city and establish the reign and rule of God's anointed king. That's the expectation. That's what they want. But remember my second point. 
but Jesus is not the kind of king that the people think he is. In fact, this being Holy Week, we're going to get into this, but John's account in Je- uh, before Jesus is crucified, Jesus goes before Pilate, and he says, my kingdom is not of this world. Let's keep reading. Verse 9 and 10. And those who went before and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. These two verses point us directly back to Psalm 118, 25, 26. We read those earlier as well. Hosanna means save us, please. It was a call to God to deliver his people. It was a part of a larger, it was a pilgrim song that the people uh, sang and they voiced their hope for God to come and save them and rescue them from their enemies. Remember, these are people living in Jerusalem, in Israel, that is occupied by an enemy nation in Rome. You now see that the people logically are drawing to this conclusion, this is the Messiah. He is here. The promised Savior King is here. And with that conclusion comes massive expectations as to how this is about to play out. But remember, my second point, Jesus isn't the king that everybody thought he was. So how do we know this? Chronologically, if we're not looking ahead at the text, if we're just right now, how do we know that this Jesus isn't the king that they thought he was. Well, three times before this, Jesus has flat out told them and predicted his death and resurrection. In Mark chapter 8, Peter responds by Jesus saying this by pulling Jesus aside, pulling, putting his arm around him and being like, hey, Jesus, look, let me tell you, buddy, it's not going to go down like that. Right? And I could just imagine Jesus kind of putting his arm back around Peter and saying, Get behind me, Satan. Right. Doesn't go well for Peter. And in Mark chapter 9, this is kind of ironic, but it actually says that the disciples did not understand and they were afraid to ask more. Now, part of me wonders, did they see what happened to Peter? And they're like, man, I ain't going there with Jesus. Right. Luke tells us in the third time that they understood none of what he had said. Why is this? Go back and read the accounts. Jesus, it's not like Jesus makes it cryptic. He just tells them, and they don't understand. They can't take him at his word. Why? Because they can't imagine that this Messiah would come and that he would go and be defeated, much less that he would go and give himself over to be defeated. You see, but Jesus isn't going into Jerusalem to deliver the nation from Rome. This isn't going to be a a military victory. There are greater ruling enemies that he is dealing with. The Bible tells us that we are sinners against a holy God. We are slaves to sin. We are filled with pride and greed and lust and jealousy and many other things that are such like these. And what they need is not a change of political power, but what they need is to be forgiven from their sins. They need to be freed from the power of sin and experience real transformation. This is why Jesus is heading into Jerusalem. He is the Lamb of God who has come to take away their sin. He is delivering them from their real threats, Satan, sin, and death. He is bringing them true good news, not just good news that brings peace between one another, but good news that brings peace between them in God. This is the true gospel. This is the true salvation that Jesus came to bring. That they could be forgiven. They can be uh, reconciled to God. They can be indwelt by the Holy Spirit. They can be transformed from the inside out and no longer be a slave to serving the things of man, but be freed now to serve the things of Of God. The irony in this story is that the people waving the palm branches are assuming that they are the good guys. 
who need to be rescued from the bad guys. But the truth is, is that we are all the bad guys. We all need salvation. And Jesus is the humble king, ready to bring salvation. And we're going to learn this week, and we're going to celebrate and rejoice on Sunday. He brings salvation through a cross and an empty tomb. Right. So how do we know that Jesus is a different king than they expected? Because at this moment, he enters the city to the praises of people crying out, Hosanna. And just a week later, he will be led out of the city to the shouts of the crowd and be crucified. They reject him because he did not meet their expectations. So what do we take away from this? I have two practical takeaways for us today. The first thing we take away is this. Jesus will not meet all of our expectations, but he will fulfill all of his promises. And those are different. Have you ever slowed down and reflected long enough to know what your expectations are of God? Have you ever wondered where they came from? Or even if they were true? I have a feeling that every day people are walking away from Jesus because he didn't meet their expectations. They imagine their life going one way and it's gone, a different, it's gone differently. They become hardened towards Jesus. They feel no need for him. And so they ultimately make the conclusion, he isn't worth it and I'm going to walk away from him. Some of you may currently be in this place. Maybe it's your health, a job promotion, a relationship, a child, the home you always wanted, the life you always wanted, etc. There's a low-grade irritation and frustration that exists in your soul. You may even show up on Sundays to your parishes, serve and give to ministries, and yet your mind is constantly on those disappointments. And there is a holding of these things against God rather than trusting him with your life. You feel like Jesus has favorites out there and that you aren't one of them. So what has Jesus promised us? What is a right expectation to have of Jesus on our life? Isn't it a little scary that many of us who are followers of Jesus are not fluent in this? Confession. I had to Google, what has Jesus promised us? <laughs> Why? Because the truth is I'm not fluent in this either. It is said in Genesis chapter 15 that God tells Abraham he's going to have a son. Abraham looking over at his very, 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 very old wife and then thinking about the things of God and then looking at his very, very, very old wife and then thinking about the things of God and then looking at his very, very, very old wife. And he goes, you know what, God, I believe you. And it says that he believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. Have you ever thought what it means to be a Christian? Is it not as simple as Jesus has said these things and that we believe him at his word? Now I know there were some acts that had to happen, but they, those acts, we understand them because Jesus explained them through his word. So is trusting Christ not as simple as taking him at his word? So I come back to my question. So what has Jesus promised us? By no means is this list exhaustive. But listen to this. If you come to me, I will forgive you. If you confess your sin, I'll take away your sins and cleanse you. I'll take away all your sins, your guilt, your shame. I'll take it all to the cross. I'll bring you into the family of God. If you believe in me, you can become sons and daughters of God. I'll give you my Holy Spirit, a spirit of power and wisdom. I'll give you my presence. I will never leave you or forsake you. I'll strengthen you when you are weak. I'll give you contentment, even in your suffering. I'll provide you a joy you didn't even know existed. I'll meet all of your needs according to my wisdom. I'll work all things together for your good. 
And when you die, they will put you in the ground. But I will raise you up again to new life. And there are so many more. Be careful with your expectations. And be fluent in Jesus' promises and hold them dearly. Jesus doesn't meet all of your expectations, but he will fulfill all of his promises. Second point. Jesus' entrance into Jerusalem is our model model for discipleship. You see, as Jesus was on this donkey heading in, this is playing out over you know, a week's time frame, for lack of a better term, right? That it is playing out over real life that there were people who had expectations and they were coming into the reality that Jesus wasn't going to meet those expectations and they were walking away from him. Even his own disciples ended up abandoning him. And it wasn't until after the resurrection that they, got, they were restored to him and that they would look upon this event and think, ah, I get it now, right? The disciples also saw this as a model for their discipleship as they were going to follow Christ in this new life that they had. They were going to follow this resurrected king. You see, Jesus' entry was one of humility. It was one of submission to his father. It was one of full obedience, one of gentleness. He suffers, and then glory follows. This should be how our life is as well, one of humility and gentleness, one of full submission to God. We will suffer in this lifetime, but glory awaits us. So what is the temptation? The temptation is glory now. We want glory now. We want a crown without a cross. We want glory without suffering. We want fullness without the feeling of brokenness. We want what we want, when we want it, and how we want it. Jesus was not immune to this. He was tempted in all these same ways. What was Satan's first temptation to Jesus? That you can have all the kingdoms if you would just bow down and worship me. All glory, no cross. How does Jesus respond to him? Sends him away. We see that when Jesus explains his suffering and his death and his resurrection to his disciples, we see that Peter grabs a hold of him. We talked about this earlier, right? And Peter's like, Jesus, this isn't going to happen this way. And Jesus looks and says, get behind me, Satan. You see, even in this moment, we see that uh, there is, Jesus doesn't go into the city with some sort of military force, but on a donkey, slowly, humbly walking into Jerusalem, knowing what is, head, what it, what is ahead of him. He will be given over and betrayed He doesn't find his arrest. He will be strapped to a cross and crucified. He knows the path to glory, and it's through suffering. You see, in summary, there will be times where all of us will come to some sort of Mount of Olive. We will be up at a high place. We will be staring ahead as to what is about to come. This could be individually, this could be us as a church community. For those of you guys who have been with us for a while, you know that we have been in this season. It has not been easy. We didn't ask for this season to come upon us. But maybe it's a season of risk, a season of sorrow, a season of difficulty, seasons of suffering willingly for the cause of Christ. Some of you guys are committed to radical generosity, giving up the comforts and laying aside a level of glory for something that is greater, going to come later that is greater. Some of you are either doing or considering foster care at this moment, knowing that it will come with hard times, and yet you are walking right into it. Let me just pause and say, if any of these are you, praise God. Keep on. May the Lord strengthen you as it gets hard. But remember, 
glory awaits. Some of us, we need to saddle up on that donkey. We need to turn from our striving for these glories now. We need to bring kindness and gentleness into our relationships, whether in the home or at work. And let me tell you, I am the chief offender in this, and I'm probably about to hear my wife say amen. We need to turn from our selfishness, and we need to start learning what it looks like to lay down our lives for the good of others. Why? Because this is the way of Jesus. You see, the kingdom of God is so different from the kingdom of this world. The path to glory is through suffering, love, sacrifice, and obedience. Don't strive for ease and power and control or comfort. Yield to the Father. Live humble, gentle lives of suffering love, sacrificial obedience, forgiveness, radical generosity, humble service to God and others. Friends, there will be seasons of loss and suffering. There will be. However, there is a promise that there will be glory in the end. The triumphal entry gives us a picture of discipleship. Jesus on the Mount of Olives, looking at Jerusalem and knowing what awaits him. And in obedience to the Father, he moves right into that peril. With gentleness, humility, and love. May we be like our Savior. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you for the encouragement that comes from this. Lord, I I thank you for this family. And Lord, I just pray uh, that whatever it is, whether it's conviction, encouragement, uh, courage, uh, whatever it may be uh, that you have for them this morning, uh, Lord, I just pray that they would yield to you. Lord, I pray that as as a body of believers here that we would walk humbly, that we would walk obediently to you, towards you. Lord, that we would love sacrificially, that we would be generous in our giving. Lord, that those who come upon us, that they would experience the goodness of Christ. And so, Lord, would you please, please be faithful to us. We thank you for your faithfulness. We pray this all in your name. Amen.